Welcome. I'd like to call to order this public hearing on the additional appropriation of Series A bond proceeds. And I'll turn it over to Gary Letteiler, who will uh, review this with us. <coughs> to the appropriation of the proceeds of the Series A bond into the library's budget. The issuance of the Series A bond and the related project were approved by the board at the February board meeting. This hearing is required under the Indiana Code before the library can include the proceeds of the Series A bond in its budget. The $2 million bond is primarily for maintenance of existing facilities and equipment. It covers a seven-year time period, which works out to about $286,000 a year. The library's technology equipment can become obsolete after three or four years. This bond will be the source of funds to provide high-quality computers and user-friendly user-friendly website with lots of capability to deliver digital materials to patrons. So here are some of the items that are included in this report. Maybe I can get to them. So <clears throat> In this report, we'll go over the appropriation resolution. Uh, we'll look at the cash balance the, uh, for the end of 2020 for the library. We'll go over the tax rate history, uh, look at a sample property tax bill for Perry Township, and look at the impact of the pandemic on the library's budget. We'll look at uh, future operating fund surplus projections. And we, there's a report from Baker Tilly with the details of the uh, finance plan for the two bonds. So this is the appropriation resolution for the $2 million bond and <clears throat> For the benefit of the audience, uh, I'll read a portion of it, the important parts, but uh, not the whole thing. Whereas the Board of Trustees of Monroe County Public Library has determined to renovate and improve certain existing library facilities, including the acquisition of certain library equipment, including information technology equipment, and certain maintenance and improvements to the existing library facilities and certain other related improvements in the library di district, all is described in a bond resolution of the library adopted <clears throat> February 17th of 2021. Whereas <clears throat> the board has determined that the estimated cost of the project and the incidental expenses necessary to be incurred in connection with the project and with the issuance of the bonds to finance the project will be in, the, in an amount not to exceed $2 million. Now, therefore, be it ordained by the Board of Trustees of Monroe County Public Library that for the purpose of paying the cost of the project and incidental expenses necessary to be in occurred with the project and the bonds, an amount not to exceed $2 million shall be appropriated from the proceeds of the bonds. So after this hearing, the board will vote on that appropriation resolution.
So the other information included in this packet um, has to do with uh, cash balance, uh, trends and expenses, trends in revenue. And a lot of these reports that I'm gonna talk about now are the same reports that are in the other two hearings. Uh, so I'll, I'll go over it in a little more detail this time, <clears throat> but won't take so much time on the next two. So, at December 31st, 2020, the total cash uh, that the library had <clears throat> was about $10,655,000. This report here uh, <clears throat> just shows the breakdown of that, um, where that cash is held in the various funds and where it's held in the various banks. This is a look at the library tax rate since 2011. And uh, it was near 11 cents per $100 of assessed value in 2011. Uh, since then, it has ranged uh, close to the 10 cents per $100 of assessed value level. And our plan going forward is to keep it at about that level. And so th this is um, uh, some data that, that uh, shows the impact that the pandemic will have on the library's budget. Um, and the determining factor, the, bi the big determining factor for the 2022 budget for the library is the growth quotient. The growth quotient is based on uh, personal income of Indiana residents. And this chart shows, it's a comparison of each quarter in 2020 compared to the previous quarter in 2019. And um, the way it works out then is that the, the estimated increase in personal income uh, from uh, 2019 to 2020, it's an increase of 4.57%. And when we average that with, with the previous five years of, of the same kind of data, the change in personal income from year to year, uh, it works out to uh, a calculated growth quotient for 2022. Uh, this is an, an estimate. It should come in fairly close to this. But it's a growth quotient of over 4%. Which, which is relatively high. Uh, and you can see below that, that over, so since uh, 2013, um, we're, we, we, we can look at what the growth quotient has been. We can see that in the early years, it was uh, under 3%, and, and then it gets up to the three and a half to four percent range in the later years. Uh, same, uh, and, and the operating fund surplus uh, corresponds somewhat to the high growth quotients. Um, 20, in 2020, the, the actual operating surplus for the library was about $1,415,000. Yes. So I'm just guessing and think that the growth quotient is going up because more businesses have been growing in Monroe County. Well, it's a statewide. Oh, so yeah, so it's yeah, it, it's it's uh, that that figure is a statewide figure. Um, and so for 2022, um, we we are estimating the four percent growth quotient and an operating surplus of a million dollars. And then we see 2023 and 2024, uh, we, we still have an estimated 
operating surplus, and that is taking into account uh, operation of the branch. And this report here is, is, is done by our um, financial consultants, Baker Tilly. Um, this, I won't go over in a, in a lot of detail. I know we've seen it a few times now, probably. Um, but the, the main uh, information here that I think is most valuable it is the repayment schedule, the debt repayment schedule. So this uh, shows our current uh, debt uh, payments in 2019 through 2021, roughly $700,000. Uh, 2022 uh, stay, stays at about 700,000. And then 2023, uh, until 2028, when the Series A bonds are paid off, the bond payments are going to run about $900,000 a year, which is about one cent per hundred dollars of assessed value, uh, which, which is what we've been projecting. Uh, this is a look at the projected tax rate, uh, and we can see in 2022 the projected tax rate for the debt levy is one penny. Uh, then it goes slightly over a penny, and then it drops down under a penny. As, as assessed value in the county grows, that's what's causing that rate to decline. So um, that's really about all the information I have for this first public hearing. I have a strange question. Yes. Um, looking at our surplus for a public library, is there ever a situation where there, uh, whoever the oversight powers that be says that you have too much surplus and you should be investing this money in different ways instead of just carrying a surplus yes yes they okay. I, the state board of accounts okay sort of incorporates that look into their their audits and and i think they're promoting you know the the long-term financial plans mm -hmm. and and that's why we haven't had anybody breathing down our necks to say hey you've got a lot of money in the bank because we have had this long-term plan okay. uh, of what we're going to do with it. Okay. Good. One of the other things that happened was um, over the past couple of years, there have been two different laws that have been passed regarding the surplus that libraries might have and the possibility that local uh, units, uh, like the county council in our, in our situation, if libraries have more than 50% surplus of their operating budget, they can reduce the overall le levy amount. Uh, but again, that's based on continuing to, to consider what, what the money is being used for. from the board. Uh, it's now time for public comment. If there are members of the public who would like to address the board, please go to the podium, state your name, and share your thoughts with us. Are there any on Zoom, Greer? We or, have none. No. Okay. Uh, seeing no public comment, do we have a motion to adopt the Series A bond additional appropriation resolution uh, reviewed by Gary and included in our packet. So moved. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on this resolution? Seeing none, all in favor of approving the of, of adopting the series a bond additional appropriation resolution please say aye 
Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Thank you. Do we have a motion to adjourn this public hearing? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 We are adjourned, and I will call to order our second public hearing. I call to order this public hearing to consider and adopt Series B additional appropriation resolution. First, we need to issue the bond. This is so it would be issuing Series B bonds. Oh, I have them. Somehow I got them out of order. Okay. Cancel that. Uh, I call to uh, order this public hearing to issue Series B bonds. And I'll turn it over again to Gary. So we will now hold the second of three public hearings tonight. This one is the preliminary determination to issue the Series B $6 million bonds. We're holding this public hearing in accordance with uh, Indiana Code 6-1.1-20-3.1. This public hearing is being held regarding the proposed Series 21B $6 million bonds and related project since the branch project constitutes a controlled project. We have provided copies of the draft preliminary determination notice to be published in the event the library adopts the final authorization for the 2021B bonds, and we are providing it for members of the public now as it includes all the information required to be available to the public during this public hearing pursuant to the Indiana Code. Some of the other information included in this report uh, the cost projections for the new branch, look at the library's cash balance. These reports underneath there are the same one, ones we went through in the first hearing that have to do with trends of revenue and so on. So we probably won't spend much time on those. Um, so this is the March update for the uh, project cost for the new branch. $12,137,000 approximately. And uh, as we can see here in our LERF uh, fund, we have about $2 million. And in our rainy day fund, we have nearly $4 million. Um, and again, this is our we, we plan to keep our tax rate in the 10 cent per hundred dollars of assessed value range for the foreseeable future. Uh, look at the uh, a sample tax bill for Perry Township. Uh, the gray portion is the library. And we've talked about this, uh, the effect of the pandemic and the trend in the library's growth quotient and surpluses for the past several years. This uh, is, uh, relates to the projected operating costs of the new branch. Uh, we're estimating uh, 675 to 700,000 a year at this point. And then uh, the Baker Tilly report showing uh, a lot of data, but the, uh, showing the bond payments. And then uh, this is the notice of preliminary determination of Monroe County Public Library to issue general obligation bonds. And I. I believe this will be published after this meeting. And then we have the bond resolution. Uh, I'm just gonna read a small portion of this, it's several pages long. Um, Whereas the board finds that there are not sufficient funds available or provided for in existing tax levies, 
with which to pay the total cost of the design, acquisition, site development, construction, equipping and furnishing of a new library branch, certain other related improvements, and to the extent funds are not needed for the design, acquisition, site development, construction, equipping and furnishing of the new library branch, for general improvements to library facilities in the library district, collectively this is called the project and the library should issue bonds in an amount of not to exceed six million dollars for the purpose of providing funds to be applied to the project and whereas the project is a controlled project pursuant to indiana code 6-1.1-20 as amended and in accordance with Indiana Code 6-1.1-20-3.1, the board has caused notice of two separate public hearings regarding the consideration of the adoption of this bond resolution, making a preliminary determination to issue bonds to be published on February 24th, 2021 and March 3rd, 2021, in the Herald Times and Ellisville Journal and mailed to the circuit court clerk of Monroe County, Indiana, and any organizations requesting copies of such notices. So that's an, <laughs> it gives you a, a pretty good idea of, of what this resolution is about, but it's, it's long and technical. And if there are any questions, we, we can certainly, we have Tom here. Well, we can certainly talk about them. Um, so that bond resolution will, will uh, let's see. So this is it. Th that's really all I have at this point, and, and I would just uh, open it up to any questions that there might be. Questions from the board for Gary? Seeing none, we have public comment. If there are any members of the public who would like to address the board on this issue, please go to the podium, state your name, and share your thoughts with us. Do we have any on Zoom, Greer? We have none. With no public comment, do we have a motion to adopt the bond resolution reviewed by Gary and included in our packet? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the bond resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Do we have a motion to adjourn the public hearing? So moved. Second. All in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 We are adjourned. And I call to order our third public hearing. Uh, I call to order this public hearing to consider and adopt Series B additional appropriation resolution. And again, I turn it over to Gary. This is the last of the three public hearings tonight. This hearing is on the additional appropriation of the Series B bond proceeds. This hearing is required under the Indiana Code before the board can approve the inclusion of the Series B bond proceeds into the library's budget. Here are some of the items included in this report. The appropriation resolution, and then the other reports are similar to the ones we've already gone over in the other hearings tonight. So this is the appropriation resolution. I'll read a portion of it. Whereas the Board of Trustees of Monroe County Public Library has determined to design, acquire, develop, construct, equip, and furnish a new library branch, undertake certain other related improvements, and to the extent funds are not needed for the design acquisition, site development, construction, equipping, and furnishing of the new library branch, to undertake certain other general improvements to library facilities in the library district, 
all as described in a bond resolution of the library adopted April 21st, 2021. Whereas uh, the board has determined that the estimated cost of the project and the incidental expenses necessary to be incurred in connection with the project and with the issuance of bonds to finance the project will be in the amount not to exceed $13 million. And whereas the board has determined to issue bonds to fund a portion of the cost of the project in an aggregate amount not to exceed $6 million. And whereas the balance of the project will be funded with other available funds of the library. And I'm skipping down. Uh, now therefore be it ordained by the Board of Trustees of Monroe County Public Library that for the purpose of paying the cost of the project and incidental expenses necessary to be incurred with the project and the bonds, an amount not to exceed $6 million shall be appropriated from the proceeds of the bonds. So that, that's basically what this appropriation resolution is about. And then we have our uh, <coughs> cash balance and trend information and Baker Tilly report. And are there any questions on this one? Um, just to make things clear, so the second bond was for six million. This bond is for six million. Mm, there's one bond for two million. The, okay, the that was the bond, first one. Series A, that was the first two one. million. Series B, six million. And then this is. Well, this is the Series B. So we're okay. we're we're doing um, eight million total. Okay. The two million Series A, six million Series B. Okay, and the total cost of the new branch is a little over twelve million. Yes. So the bond will pay fund half of it, and yes. then our reserve money will pay the other half. Correct. We are such good stewards. <laughs> <laughs> and this this um, resolution is actually just to authorize our our spending of that money. Of that money. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. things sure clear, that's clear, clear. we we want to do that Are there any other questions from the board for Gary <laughs> thank you Gary and we now have public comment if there are members of the public who would like to address the board on this issue please go to the podium state your name and share your thoughts with us any on zoom Greer there are none Seeing no public comment, do we have a motion to adopt the Series B additional appropriation resolution? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the Series B additional appropriation resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 We are adjourned. That is our final public hearing. And now we move on to our regular board meeting. I call to order this board meeting of the Monroe County Public Library Board of Trustees. Uh, as is our tradition, we'll go around, introduce our ourselves, and if you care to share what you're reading. You want to start us off, please, Fred? Um, yes. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I'm reading a book um, called Eisenhower, and uh, it's very, very interesting to uh, read about his early life. And uh, I'm enjoying it quite a bit. Thank you, Fred. Hi, I'm Jamie Burkhart, and my read is very different than Fred's. <laughs> I just started the Dragonette Prophecies of the Wings of Fire series because I work with a couple kiddos who wanted to read that. So that's what I'm currently reading. Um, I'm Chris Harrison, and I'm reading The Bridge of Souls by V.E. Schwab. 
I'm Marilyn Wood, and I am reading The Ku Klux Klan in the Heartland by James Madison. Very, very good book. I'm John Walsh. I just finished uh, Love and Summer by Irish uh, novelist, short story writer, William Trevor. And I just started into Madame Bovary, which I've not read before. <laughs> I'm David Ferguson, and I just finished Attics, about Crispus Attics and Oscar Robertson. It's very good. Um, and I didn't know if I ever mentioned it before, but you've probably already read it. Uh, the Night Circus. Oh, yeah. Have you guys heard of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. that that's, yep. It's crazy. It, it is. It's really good. I, I just I can't recommend that highly enough. I am Kari Essery, and I am reading The Splendid and the Vile about Churchill by Eric Larson. Wonderful. I'm Kathy Loser, and I'm about to finish The Lost Apothecary. It's a fiction book about an apothecary killer in the 1700s in London by Sarah Penner. It's exciting. Quick read. Diving into our agenda, do we have a motion to approve our monthly uh, consent agenda, including minutes of prior meetings, uh, monthly financial report, bills for payment, uh, personnel reports, and our meeting calendar? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion, corrections to the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Uh, and next, I'll turn it over to Marilyn for the monthly director's report. Thanks, John. Well, I have the pleasure of introducing you to one of our newest employees tonight. Uh, this is our benefits and payroll coordinator, Melissa Brewer, who is in the audience. Uh, Melissa will be joining us at these meetings later in the year when we begin to discuss benefits, packages, and vendors and things. She previously worked for 17 years at IU in their financial operations as a financial operations manager in the Office of Vice President Communications and Marketing, but most recently she managed the HR office for a local firm. Um, so her responsibilities in the past have included an annual review of employees' benefit plan provisions and related cost options. And she established new payroll procedures and performed audits and special reporting for the business office, ensuring that all federal, state, and local taxes or requirements were met. So we extend a very warm welcome to Melissa. Uh, the other thing that I just wanted to, to touch on tonight, uh, later in the meeting, we have an update from Ned on IT, and he'll be talking a bit about some of the ways that we provided support to both our staff and the public um, during the pandemic or what our response was. But one of the things that we were very fortunate also to have happen uh, during the pandemic, and this was around uh, the end of the year, um, we received two grants, uh, and those were both in support of, of helping to reduce the digital divide, which was really very apparent uh, during the pandemic because there were both students who have e-learning needs as well as, as families or adults as they were doing tele-business, uh, tele-health, uh, uh, work, and, and much more. And the city estimates that in Bloomington there are about 12% of the population does not have internet access. So we, uh, with those two grants, um, they, we were able to pr purchase 20 additional hotspots. And uh, the, the Wall Family Charitable Trust and the city's digital equity grant um, contributed to that cause. Uh, we now have 50 hotspots in total. Wow. And the good news on that is that for the first time since we've had hotspots, we don't have a hold queue. Uh, so we're hopeful that this is really gonna be uh, a boon, uh, a, a boost to help uh, folks have internet. Uh, how long can they keep them for? I'm gonna ask Greer to answer that. Mm -hmm. Usually they're seven days with one renewal. Okay. 
and then if they need it longer, they bring it back and they can recheck it out, or how does that work? Well, now, because we don't have a holds queue, they, they're able to renew them. Uh, previously, when there was a holds queue of 30 to 50 deep, it was like, sorry, somebody else was waiting. But yeah. now that we actually have some of them on the shelves, people will be able to renew them. Great, thank you. Have there been any um, problems with um, range or not working properly, or are they pretty well stable and so no matter took, where they are used? Yeah, we took a hard look at the heat map for uh, T-Mobile before we transitioned to that mm -hmm. service provider, and it was pretty strong in Monroe County, but there are some mm -hmm. dead spots. We occasionally get a patron saying it doesn't work very well mm -hmm. out here, and sometimes it's tough to tell if it's because of coverage and they're in one of those dead spots, or if it's a you know, user error or what have you. But I'd say on the whole, we don't get a whole lot of negative feedback about mm -hmm. coverage, so it seems to be working pretty well. And are these all um, kind of locked into T-Mobile, or is there a flexibility? Yes. We, we work with T-Mobile exclusively uh, through their government services program, Okay. Um, but are always looking at options and mm -hmm. what's going to work best for us. So, okay. Yeah. So you're not stuck with T-Mobile? Oh, no. Okay. No. I got it. Okay. And in fact, it's the second correct vendor that we have used. The right. first, we're much more pleased with this service than we okay. were. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there any, uh, are you done with the I am. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Marilyn on her director's report? Um, I just wanted to comment about the popularity of the make and take kits. Yes. And um, just for our television viewing audience, where can people pick those up now that the library is fully open. They're not just at the door anymore. <laughs> uh, generally, we have those on our hold shelves. So and if there's anything that's different because of its size or something like that, we let people know when they, <clears throat> when they place that so request. Do you have to place a hold for the yes. state kids? Yes. There's a limited number. OK. Perfect. Have we haven't heard anything about the didn't you have a seed library or something? We do have a seed library. It's How's that phenomenally going? popular. Okay. <laughs> um, we, we gave our, uh, away, um, oh, now it's going to escape me, more than a 1,000 seeds, I know that, um, that uh, particularly in March as it just opened up and, and people were very excited uh, to, to, use, mm -hmm. to make use of it. but it's getting near the end of the school year. Are we anticipating a more traditional summer reading program this summer? We'll use, uh, we'll use the same uh, virtual uh, tools that we used last year, but certainly we hope that kids will come in and visit us and, and get more um, uh, opportunity to, to try new things, new books, get recommendations, et cetera, but we'll still use um, Beanstack as our tool. Any other questions for Marilyn? And we'll have, let's see, it's May that we generally have Lisa come talk to us, mm -hmm. so we'll do that again. Thank you, Marilyn. Moving on to old business, um, an update from Greer Carson on continuous improvement update. Thank you, John. So we referred to continuous improvement here and there over the past few months. Tonight, we'd like to share an overview of this important initiative. Since late 2019, we've been planning for an internal review to help identify needs for improvement in areas ranging from operational details to communication best practices to norms of staff culture. Much like our strategic planning process where we seek public input on our services, programs, collections, and overall responsiveness to community needs, this internal review began with an ask for our staff to share their experiences on the job, their perspectives on what works well and what improvements we might make in order to better serve our community. At the February 2020 Staff Day event, all MCPL employees participated in facilitated small group conversations, which generated a tremendous amount of feedback. This feedback was sometimes general, like our reporting structure creates some confusion, and sometimes specific, like we need better digital communication guidelines. And out of this feedback, we discern four general themes. 
ambiguity surrounding roles and responsibilities for some positions and or within some departments, or we call them units. The importance of accountability with regard to job performance and professionalism in the workplace. Stronger training and onboarding programs across the library and within some specific units. And enhanced communication and collaboration tools and the establishment of clear communication norms. So based on these four themes and considering additional details and feedback from staff, as well as leadership and administration discussions, we identified eight continuous improvement action items. These are aimed at reviewing current practices and developing proposals for improvements or in some cases, alternatives to current practices. The formal process began in January of this year. We have eight teams, each focused on a single action item and charged with eventually submitting a proposal for improvement. Each team consists of five or more staff members, is led by two or more members of the leadership team, and these teams meet independently, no less than once a month, so more often, hold monthly progress meetings with administration, progress reports are then shared out with all staff for additional review and feedback, and the team leads themselves also meet once a month to share their respective work and to identify potential points of confluence that such a wide-ranging internal review is likely to generate. Each team is ultimately charged with submitting a proposal for improvement and an implementation plan. The action items vary in scope and range from reviewing specific unit structure to proposing changes to our hiring and performance management practices to updates and or alternatives to our staff intranet and digital collaboration platforms. This is an iterative, inclusive, and highly transparent process, which we will expect will yield significant improvements and help us better prepare for expansion with our Southwest branch while continuing to provide the very best service to our patrons and our community at large. We look forward to sharing the results of this initiative with you all later this year and to ultimately discussing the long-term outcomes. I'm happy to answer any questions or speak to any specifics. So, I knew I'd need this. <laughs> the specific eight action items are to reevaluate the community and customer engagement unit, or we call it COCU, for improved organizational effectiveness, to reevaluate the access and content services unit for improved organizational effectiveness, that's ACS or collection management and development, to reevaluate the role of the strategist with regard to core duties, supervision, and overall leadership responsibilities, to research and propose a performance management program that ensures equitable, ongoing, and consistent evaluative measures and work support plans for staff. That's a long one, so. To reevaluate current hiring procedures with regard to industry best practices, evolving trends, and overall interviewing consistency to identify and propose a system-wide onboarding and training program that facilitates ongoing organizational understanding while allowing for unit level and job specific training and professional development. To adopt and implement an enhanced digital workspace solution to aid in facilitating effective internal collaboration and to standardize best practices for communication and finally, to facilitate a greater degree of transparency between leadership and staff regarding suggestions and feedback and their ongoing impact on operational decision making. Thank you. All staff are involved in one form or another. We have uh, individuals who are part of the specific teams. Uh, we also have what we call resource staff, folks who are volunteered to provide input on one or more team's charges. Um, and then that big transparency piece is to share out our monthly progress reports with all staff, open it up for comments, talk about them in all staff meetings. So what's really unique about this process is that some of it's, there are difficult conversations, it's some heavy lifting work, but we're doing it together. So when we arrive at some proposals for changes, nobody's gonna be surprised and everyone will have been involved in one form or another. So we're quite excited about it, a little nervous, but ultimately, I think, proud of the fact that we're doing it this way, we're doing it together. Well, congratulations on doing this work. Thank you. When again is the timeline when you plan to wrap it up? 
So it's difficult to say because the teams are going to work at different paces relative to their charge. Uh, but by the end of the year, we will have proposals and an implementation plans for all of them. And probably at least half, if not more, will implementation will have already started. So I'd like to give you all a, an update later in the year on where we are with that. My expectation for discussing meaningful outcomes is more realistically in 2022. Any other questions for Greer on this topic? Then we'll move on to our next item, also with Greer, an uh, update on the Southwest Branch. Okay, so we are in the weeds, and that is a great place to be. We're wrapping up the design development phase, which is all about details. The puzzle is kind of starting to come together and take shape. We are literally in daily contact with our architects over many details. And we're looking closely at what's going to go into each space in the branch. So for example, shelving layout for physical collections, the number and arrangement of desktop computers and dedicated public catalog computers, the projection and audio solutions for programming and collaborative spaces, the teaching kitchen appliances, the countertop specs, the seating and instructional tools that will go into that unique space, the digital signage monitors and meeting room whiteboards, places in the branch for hanging artwork, the location of electrical and data ports to meet current plans as well as anticipating future technology needs, public and staff restroom fixtures, staff workspaces and lounge areas, doors, windows and locks, and of course, furniture. Over the next two months, we'll continue to work closely with Christine and Chris of Matthew Arch Architects on these and other functional and aesthetic considerations. And then this will conclude the branch review and design team's work and we will transition to the branch construction team. We expect to advertise for construction bids in July and receive bids in August. Once construction begins, hopefully in September, our branch construction team will come together to begin the year-long process of reviewing each stage of construction, responding to change orders, and updating staff on progress. So we encourage everyone, of course, to take a trip up to the third floor and take a look at the designs, but we're happy to answer any questions here as well. I know she said something about artwork. Are you commissioning artwork or are you seeking out local artists or is this the artwork That's a great question. <laughs> I, that's to be determined. I think oh, we'd very okay. much like to engage the community and the, the local uh, art community in particular. But we know we want to have space within the branch to, to display artwork. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was going to suggest um, how about eliciting artwork from the students of Bachelor Middle School, which are nearby. Not a bad idea. We had a good conversation <laughs> with uh, the folks at Bachelor just about a week ago about, hey, we're going to be neighbors. Let's start talking and kicking some ideas around. And there are a lot of them. Great. And that's Great. a good one. We'll add that to the list. I just have a refreshing my memory of that area. Is there a, a limestone company close by or? No, I'm, not no? that. Not that no. direction? No, okay. it's. I'm thinking way out in May th Road. Th That's too far yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. on top. Um, yeah. No, I, we're um, just off Rogers. Okay. Yeah. So I have to drive there, there again. Gordon. A little further back. I think you're thinking. Yeah, I'm thinking way back, back. Yeah. On the other side of that. But it'd be nice to have some limestone sculptures there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we're certainly intend money, to have <laughs> a lot of natural things there in the the. The facility itself is going to be limestone and metal and mm -hmm. and lots of wood incorporated in it. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very exciting. I think one of the biggest things that will come to all of you next is in July. Um, the construction documents will be complete at that point, and it would be the point at which you will all vote on sending it to bid, mm -hmm. um, and then the bids will go out and be back to us in September. So it's sort of all, all of these things fall in place. We have to have a bid before we actually sell the bond. And we've done all of the bond paperwork now. We need to go to the county council for that in June. Um, and so there's several things that are lined up before September. Is there any concern that um, I know they've discussed that construction costs are increasing just because materials yeah. are increasing, that that could negatively impact our plan? Well, there's always a worry for that. Mm -hmm. um, I do think uh, we've, we've been following uh, very closely each step of the process and having it estimated each time, but mm -hmm. certainly it could, certainly on timing as well. And that, mm -hmm. of course, just increases the cost. 
Any other questions uh, or comments on the Southwest Branch update? Is this an action item? The gift, no. the gift policy? No. 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 Okay. Then we move on to um, reviewing our gift policy. And so I bring this here to you tonight uh, be, just to have a discussion and sort of help me um, understand uh, if you'd like to take this anywhere. Uh, our current gift policy does not have any <clears throat> any guidelines or suggestions about naming possibilities and that's certainly with the new branch on the horizon the possibility that we might be able to do some fundraising to name either branches and or rooms or other parts of the facility. It's a it's a fundraising opportunity for us. But um, certainly before we would go down that road we would want to have a, um, a very clear policy in place that would at least outline some things like, well, you know, from a very basic level, at what point would we say if you give us this much money, we would consider it for a naming possibility as well as the kinds of um, or parameters that we might use for what naming would be. It's not just anyone or anything. Um, and so I want, I sent to you a few uh, suggested links um, from libraries that that have naming policies so you can get a, a, a feel for the kinds of things that they include. Um, and at the very least, it would be things like the length of the naming and or the ability to remove it if um, there are some controversies that arise. And then certainly approval by the board um, for both the naming and or plaques or other things that might commemorate it, um, and the minimum donation, et cetera. So my question for you is if you are interested in pursuing this first and then we can review these and, and discuss them if you like. Um, and then if, we're, if we continue to be interested, I can draft something and bring it back to you. But I'd just like to know before we begin that what your, what your thoughts are. And do you know if we've ever had a naming policy? policy? I can't remember back if we've ever had one. Not in my lifetime here, okay. but I don't know if that. Yeah don't know about it before. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I'm torn because I know that a public library is a public library. It's for everybody. And I know the popular thing to do now with public universities and many things is, okay, you give me so many millions of dollars. I will name this building after you or this room after you. And it just sort of speaks of elitism. And I don't, I don't know. I, I, I can see it both ways because, of course, we all need funding. But in a public building that's for everybody, do we really want to begin this elitism of, of naming things after people just because they happen to be lucky and getting more money than somebody else? But they're also giving the money. so. But there's also so that's the... That's kind of the key. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, that is. It's not just that they were lucky to get the money, but yeah. that... We but were lucky to get it from I, them. But then what about the, the person that's volunteered so many hours of their mm -hmm. life? Are they going to mm -hmm. get the same naming rights too because they've donated a different type of gift? It's not money, but it's time or it's mm -hmm. energy or it's... Right. And in fact, some of those uh, policies, I, they called it donor recognition and mm -hmm. the donor, that recognition could be for those people who, mm -hmm. have, yeah. who have given of themselves in a different way. I yeah. think it's it's the way we you present it, and I think it's uh, it, the naming policy would help us guide the donations to a point where I think that I I I don't view it elitist. I view it as the people are helping the community for the community. Yeah, and I see it a yeah. different way. Yeah, I, I think which is we fine. We yeah, do yeah. decide to do this. We need to do different options and opportunities that are attainable for mm -hmm. different levels of income. Mm -hmm. For example, I know some schools have done fundraising for like, you know, the, the brick mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we're in a, a state where we're having new construction, we can incorporate that in other ways, like maybe it goes into the amphitheater or, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, if, if we decide to do something like this, having multiple ways that you mm -hmm. could contribute. And that would probably be entailed in the naming policy. I think mm -hmm. it's a good idea to have such a thing, for sure. Because you can get down the road, like at the high school at North, they had um, the auditorium, named Lester Smith Auditorium, and somebody wanted to usurp that name 
and there was no, you know, we had to do a lot of research about it. Well, what does that mean? Can we legally do this? Can we legally not do that? So there was no real policy right. or history of what happened and how it happened that it was named that. So I think it's a good idea to have everything in guidelines or policy or whatever if we pursue that. Because I'm sure that there's going to be people who want to contribute. It seems always like have we need to be coached by somebody. Yeah. Well, I was I mean, going to say, we always have the option to say no. Mm -hmm. us, right? I don't know. Yeah. We have a lot of experience. And who would mm -hmm. who would be a good person to do that? Isn't there some sort of school of philanthropy at yeah. Indiana yeah. University? Yeah. Is there somebody at SPIA? You know, and Indiana University has the the Indiana University Foundation. And sure. There's all mm -hmm. sorts of, there's a local mm -hmm. foundation. It seems like there'd be a lot of people who could say, not that they'd be right, not that mm -hmm. they'd necessarily be dead on for our particular situation, but they might be able to say, here are some ideas. Mm -hmm. And I like what you've done. I mean, the, the three libraries, yeah. I like mm -hmm. some of their thoughts. But I think, yeah, I, I don't know, it just feels mm -hmm. funny. Like if we all sat in a room and said, okay, here's a new problem. Yeah. We're mm -hmm. all creative and thoughtful and it'd be fun and all that, but I don't know that it'd be the best. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, I can it, I can work on bringing someone to to have mm -hmm. a discussion with us. Maybe somebody that could tell us all the things that go wrong. Yeah, if you have one. Well, maybe even the yeah. school corporation has somebody because I do know there's little things named in different schools, different places, and those are public schools. So. And I like the one who was it was it East Lansing that said, hmm. "After 20 years, we have the right to take your name down." Mm -hmm. That was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Lester Smith? Is that it, North? Yeah. Yeah, it's the Lester Smith Auditorium. I had no he, idea. Has it yeah. always been named that? Yeah. Uh huh. And when I mean always, I mean since 1973. <laughs> yes, because he, they gave substantial amount of money to yeah. build they it. They don't use that. It's all. It's a plaque right there. They okay, want to take plaque. the plaque. Wow. Well, it, I've been retired for several <laughs> years, so who knows? It was there when you left. It was there when I was left. Yeah. But when they refer to it, they don't. They don't. They say don't call it, it the Lester, Lester Smith. Lester Smith Auditorium. But when you walk in, in the hallway, it's right there. <laughs> it's wow. a big bronze plaque. Okay. Maybe that's yeah. something you put into the. Mm -hmm. You take your policy. Right. Give yeah. policy. Yeah. Whether or not you have to refer to well, it. Well, I think not. the other thing that, that I've seen in the past is the people who give money often are very sophisticated about it. And they don't want their name on it. Well, some yeah. don't, mm -hmm. but I, my point is if you're not sophisticated in receiving it, mm -hmm. you know, yes. the, the people giving it are, are much more sophisticated mm -hmm. at that than, than we would yeah. be receiving it. So it's mm -hmm. nice to have a little sophistication. Sure. Yeah. And there are people locally who could help with that with guidelines and mm -hmm. the way things can go wrong. Yeah. Better to plan ahead. Yeah. Well, and thankfully, we think we have enough to build it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> hopefully. We, we do, and I think we also, I can't, I can't say it because they haven't voted on it yet, but the Friends of the Library are planning on a substantial donation to us as well. Oh. Um, so that will that will help for some of those things that we know we don't know um, mm -hmm. that will at least give us a little bit more latitude and, and yeah. hope less worry. Mm -hmm. Attention, library patrons. <laughs> <laughs> it must be time to close. <laughs> so okay, so what I take from this is that. Um, I will do a little um, research and find out who we might have to come speak with us about the, any kinds of problems we might encounter and also just ways that we would want to approach people and work with them. Okay. The other thing to think of is at this point, people have given money to the friends. Right. And they're just listed as the friends. Right. Are we going to offend the friends and all the people who have given money to the friends if we start pointing out, well, this person gave this much and this person gave this much, they, but they, I gave it as a friend. I don't know. I don't know. Well, the friends is interested in us doing this as well. They, okay. they would okay. like. If well, that's the their friends blessing, does have then. donation levels, right, mm -hmm. that they, yeah, they, do. they do publish. Right. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. For membership, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm sure it varies across the country, but I'd be curious to know how common it is. I know schools and universities, public do this, but do cities and counties name their buildings after yeah. donors? Yeah, Charlotte Zitlow. Well, that was in a 
No, I mean, it wasn't. That wasn't a contribution. It was just. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's what that's they normally honor. historically yeah. have yeah. done it for someone who's made a contribution to the community. You know, uh, that might include financial, but you know, it's it's service. something else. Yeah. Service mm -hmm. generally, um, or you know, some other thing in politics or military, but. Um, it does happen, yeah. and there are, um, at least in Indiana, um, I reached out to libraries to find mm -hmm. out if they had policies, and Tippecanoe has one, mm -hmm. um, St. Joe has one, um, Johnson County's working on one. Mm -hmm. Theirs is probably more related to some of the things that you were discussing about having levels that are attainable mm -hmm. um, and the way that they were describing theirs. But, you know, the yeah. other thing that I've seen um, that at, the, at the union, maybe, there's like a place where they have uh, a list of donors. Mm -hmm. So I know the friends list, mm -hmm. you know, because I get the mailings. Right. Mm -hmm. And so maybe, I can't remember, but it seems like they would list, you know, mm -hmm. people who have given money. So it's kind of interesting mm -hmm. when I went to the union and they had like a whole wall of donors. Yeah. Well, and that yeah. was kind of an interesting the, thing where people could maybe be recognized at the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at the library it's real interesting because if you go into that i don't know what it's called but it's that basketball hall of fame building next to the assembly hall mm -hmm. and if you walk in there it's the practice rooms right yeah it's really very nicely done and i had several relatives that used to work for cook cook put everybody's name hmm. on the wall between the elevators. If, have you ever gone in there? It's really a cool building. It's been locked every time I've tried to oh. go. <laughs> it's never been locked. Well, maybe today, yeah. But it's really neat because the, the theory was that they all contributed because they worked for Cook. And every single person's name oh, cool. is on that wall as you walk. And it's just really cool to go, oh, there's, oh, I know that person, you know? Oh, that's cool. They didn't contribute money, but they worked for Cook. Right. And Cook yeah. said, you know, they contributed because of it. in their way. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not suggesting we do that because <laughs> oh, it's a nifty. big wall. That's nifty. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there are different ways to, yes. to um, commemorate them mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it, yeah. And for libraries, I'd be interested in knowing not just who has policies, but who's gotten, you know, half a million dollars or, you know, what has been the payoff of the policy and I'm sure some of that's confidential, but just some anecdotes of, you know, well, this library got this much money, mm -hmm. you know, to name a branch or a, a room or whatever, so we know what, you know. You know, it's always hard about that. People give money to, to, for the building, but then you really have to build it. You know, you have to build mm -hmm. it in because, like, for example, we're already building the building. We know we want it. We know we have ongoing maintenance and, and all that. So, I mean, it's our it's our project. Well, but sometimes when people give money and they want to do a building and you always think, wait a minute, did you get enough money not only to build it but to take care of it yeah. for mm -hmm. time immemorial because, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know, the expenses go up. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that, that we haven't done in terms of fundraising so much because we have the friends and, and they do a lot of stuff, but occasionally if there were a project, you know, if there were something where we said, oh, we want to do this, you know, uh, maker boxes, mm -hmm. you know, you, you could have a, a sponsorship type thing, you know, where you say, these are brought to you by mm -hmm. the Jones family who generously gave, you know, mm -hmm. to provide this for you. Or I, I was at the library once, I think I sent you a photograph where they had iPads yeah. that you could kind of check out. And I could see somebody saying, yeah, the, you know, this family or this company donated these 20 iPads, which you can check out. I mean, it's kind of a time limited mm -hmm. thing. You know, I don't know about you guys. I had an iPad and it, I, it only lasted a couple of years before it was obsolete. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that stuff comes and mm -hmm. goes pretty fast. Mm -hmm. But it seems like there'd be a lot of needs like that for mm -hmm. a library mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the librarians could say, man, I could think of a lot of ways we could use some short term, maybe not so large donations but that would also give an opportunity to name something for someone that, you know, would be limited in, in Well, I was almost thinking about like a, like a sponsorship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe yeah. we, not large gifts, but, you know, like Adopt a Road, you know, where like you, exactly. you sponsor mm -hmm. something for a year mm -hmm. or, you know, is, we think about something like that. Is that our, we already have a gift policy already, right? We do. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. 
but this it, would be marrying the gift policy and the naming policy together it, as it, one? I, that's how I would see it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's just a form of, of a gift, but mm -hmm. very specific for a specific need, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I could even think of something like you know, thinking um, of our branch program, sponsoring programming in our new kitchen, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or something mm -hmm. like that, or, or the seed library mm -hmm. or other things where we have been fortunate to get grants and other things in the past, but for a sustainable future. Mm -hmm. Could we, uh, could we could create cool. even a library page for things like that where people in the community who wanted to give to the library could go and see what the needs are so that they could contact and say, hey, I'm interested in, I see that you need, mm -hmm. so that we uh, could yeah. have that available. Yeah, given the grant process, it almost feels like it'd be easier to get money from the community at times. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like With almost, many cases, you know, yes. setting, yeah. up, setting up something internally yeah. for community. Well, and I think that that's or, something that we could work with the friends yeah. on to, you know, yeah. the, mm -hmm. the, the question there becomes what just becomes passed through money versus what goes what? into the friends. Mm -hmm. But but we would have to work through those details. But I think that's a good idea, just to have a page mm -hmm. of once, kind of like the volunteer network has, yeah. you know, yeah. the things that people exactly. are looking for. Yeah, the yeah some things might lend themselves to a one time and other things you might want to say, gosh, we'd really rather have an endowment. Yeah, something that would pay, that would for pay forever. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I could see different um, local businesses that cater to kids, you know, spots giving money for the summer reading program because yeah. mm -hmm. that right. costs a lot every Absolutely. year, you know, mm -hmm. a local bookstore yeah. or some of the kids' entertainment things. And mm -hmm. They used to always publish a wish list. Of course, the HT is no longer locally owned, but um, I, I know that when I was at the, the, the school, in the MCCSE, they always would submit. I don't know if it's even been done anymore, where that you could uh, organization. Some schools could, have one where yeah. like the teachers. But this was a, a total wide community wish list I, well, from like girls that. club, well, boys club. That. You remember that? Yeah. And that a lot cool. of times my husband and I would we'd pick something out and go let's let's give them their wish, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I always mm -hmm. was successful in getting, you know, it wasn't something. Do they still do it? Yes. The wish list. Under the opportunity. Okay. But this was done like right around the holidays. Yes, it yes. still is. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's good. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's worth pursuing. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll do. Thank you for that good discussion. Uh, and now we move to our monthly update and welcome Ned Bow, Manager of Information Technology. I'm the IT Department Manager. Uh, this is my first IT department update uh, to the board since the pandemic began, so it feels like it's been a long time since I've talked to you guys. Um, and I'm going to start just by uh, letting you know the names of the folks in my department because we're a small department and uh, I'm really proud of them and just want to make sure their names are listed here tonight. So Luke Sinex is our info information technology assistant. That's a part-time position. and He's been with the library since 2017, so that's three and a half years. Vanessa Schwegman is our info technology analyst. She's been with us since 2007, so that's 13 years. And Cody Mullis is our information technology specialist who started in 2005, so he's been with the library 15 years this year, um, which I think speaks to the organization that, at least in my department, there's not a whole lot of turnover. Uh, the folks that have been here have been here long enough to be really good at their jobs and uh, to get a really good reputation inside the library, and I'm really proud of those guys. So um, what's the total FTE for your unit, or full-time? Uh, there's two full-time and one part-time, and then myself, so depending on how you want to count that. Yeah. Um, That's a lot of work for three and a half people. It is. They, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of overlap, but Vanessa is mostly uh, responsible for the Polaris database and the phone system. Cody does most of the network and internal stuff, uh, and Luke is part-time, so he does a little of both, but he also does some program development. I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute. So um, tonight I'm, I'm gonna be talking about what our department did to support the library during all the changes we've been through over the past year. Uh, some of this may be things you've heard about in other ways over the year, um, but please feel free to stop me if you have any questions about what I'm going over. Um, remote work for staff wasn't something we'd pursued in a big way before last year. Uh, when the library closed, we kind of had to scramble to figure out how we were uh, going to proceed with that. 
Um, our first few leadership team meetings that we did remotely, we were using Google Meet, um, which was all right, but we ended up switching over to Zoom pretty quickly uh, to get the quality and make it actually work for the number of people that we had. Um, but that was like our first big uh, sort of how are we gonna do this question. Um, and last, as I said last year, we hadn't done a whole lot in terms of looking at how to provide remote work for library staff. We had talked about it, uh, but the nature of the work we do at the library is really sort of an in-person thing, so we hadn't really pursued that. We had set up a few staff for remote access to the library network in certain circumstances. Uh, and we've done uh, what we consider remote connectivity in outreach services for a long time, uh, basically through the bookmobile. Uh, but beyond that, we didn't have a work from home model in place. Uh, that said, more and more staff are using laptops, so that was a, a place for us to start. Those staff could already access their email and their Google Drive resources from home, but they didn't have a good way to access the Polaris database uh, or to uh, use our phone system remotely. So first we had to figure out who had adequate inter internet access at home. That's something we sometimes take for granted, but it's not something uh, you can take for granted when people depend on it. We're fairly lucky in that regard. Most of our staff had at least some form of access, and for those who needed it, uh, because we weren't circulating them at the time, we had some Wi-Fi hotspots that we could repurpose. Um, and then we had to figure out who had access to a computer at home um, and how we could supply computers to those folks who needed them. Again, a, a lot of staff had what they needed um, or they already had a library laptop assigned to them. Um, but we were able to uh, look at laptops that are in our collection and repurpose those. Those are some laptops that we have in our collection that we circulate through uh, the teen center and some that are used in-house for training. So we actually had a fair number of laptops that we could repurpose uh, uh, and get them configured for staff use. Um, for the staff who needed to work in our patron database, though, the, having a laptop and internet access wasn't enough. We needed to give them remote access to our Polaris database. Uh, normally, uh, that isn't something that staff can easily access outside of the building. Um, to do that, we used our existing VPN system, and this is what we've been using with the Bookmobile, uh, and expanding that so that we could connect uh, more staff using that. Um, and then we created an extra terminal server on site to handle the increased remote access. And when, once staff were connected over our secure VPN, they connect to the terminal server with a remote desktop, um, and then they have access to Polaris through that. So um, I think that was about as easily as we could have made it, or as easy as we could have made it for staff with our existing technology. Um, the other remote service that was an initial challenge for us was to change the way our phone system works. We had only looked at providing phone services inside the library. So a patron calls the library, they need to talk to somebody, they get connected to a, a line within the building. Uh, our phone system is, uh, the vendor is Mitel, and that system required some upgrades to allow library calls from off-site, but we were able to put those in place. Vanessa was the uh, person doing most of the work on that. We appreciate your coming to the library today. However, we are open 11 to 7, Monday through Thursday, 11 to 6 on Friday and Saturday, and noon to 5 on Sunday. We thank you for visiting the Monroe County Public Library, and we regret to inform you that the library is now closed. <laughs> So after some upgrades to our phone system, uh, it was possible for staff to install an app on their personal phone, on a cell phone, and be able to use the system. So they were able to take calls from the public uh, from home. So between the phone system and the remote network connections, we were able to uh, have staff take calls and get into the database like they would if they were here in the building. Um, at, at that point, though, we were still all just working from home. Um, uh, as we moved people back into the building and we were looking at ways to check out materials while we're closed, uh, we started looking at different ways to do that. Um, 
we ended up going with a vendor, uh, Kapira, who had a solution for making reservations for picking up hold. But in the process of looking at that, we really thought long and hard about whether that was something we could build uh, in-house. Luke and Cody have both worked on uh, our internal rooms reservation, uh, not the ones that we use for the, the big public meeting rooms, but the ones that we use in Level Up and at the Teen Center uh, to reserve those resources in the study rooms. That's something that they built in-house because uh, the vendor that we had been working with didn't, wasn't giving us exactly what we needed. Uh, so while we went with another vendor for holds pickup, we used some of that uh, capabilities that we had built in-house and we expanded that uh, to build uh, computer, uh, unlimited computer access for patrons uh, that actually took place in this room, in these rooms. Um, that was a way to provide a limited amount of computer access to patrons while still keeping a control on how many were in the building. Uh, and that reservation system was something that we had built in-house. And we used um, similar technology to make pickup uh, systems that we are still using for print requests and for the take and make kits. So um, it's stuff that you kind of, you don't interact with more than just filling out a form and getting it, but I, it's stuff that I'm really proud that my team has been able to put together. Um, let's see. And then I think um, moving forward, I guess the only stuff I wanted to touch on was that um, we've been doing a lot of work on a new sign-up system for library volunteers. You'll see that on the public website soon. Uh, but that's something that we've worked uh, with Lorraine for a while now and trying to get them a tool that works better for how they want to manage their volunteer information, make it easier for people to sign up. Uh, Cody and Luke have both been working on that, and we're really excited to see that go live. Um, one of the teams that Greer was talking about is a team that is looking at new tools for our internet. So we're, Cody and I are on that team, and we're looking at that as well. Um, and we're excited about mapping out the network at the new branch. Uh, we've just started looking at what we're going to need for that. Uh, it's always fun to start from scratch with a new location and new technology. Um, we, we plan on doing some network improvements here at Maine over the next year or two as well, uh, but it's probably not the sort of stuff that people are going to notice. And it's stuff that uh, those of us who manage it internally can get excited about, but you probably won't see much difference for yourself. Uh, that's all I had to cover, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Did the, the um, staff that use their personal cell phones, did they incur any extra additional cost on their own, or did they just eat it, or did you compensate them in any way for using their own personal phones? I don't know of anybody who incurred more. Okay. I, I hope they don't. The way, the way the system works out, and it works better if, it, if they have this, if they have Wi-Fi okay. at home, you can set it to only use Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I, not that I know of. I can't okay. say for sure that nobody did, but we tried to make it so that it was, mm -hmm. it was neutral. Yeah, the using their personal phones was something we kind of went back yeah. and forth on too, but I don't think we could have uh, provided that. We had a couple staff who didn't have good Wi-Fi uh, at home, but they had good bandwidth, and we were able to take their mm -hmm. handsets home to them so they could use that rather than a cell phone. Any other questions for Ned? Well, thank you, Ned, to you and your team. There's an incredible amount of IT in the library to keep things running, and it's um, great that you and your, your small staff are able to keep up with it and do all the adapting you've had to do uh, to help us all through the pandemic situation. So thank you so much. It's now time for public comment. Are there, if there are members of the public who would like to address the board, please go to the podium, state your name, and share your thoughts with us. Anyone on Zoom, Greer? We have none. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 The ayes have it. We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone.